It's Wednesday, October 23rd. I'm Jane Coaston, and this is Water Day, the show where we're congratulating all of the Americans who got four-figure checks this week as part of a $300 million class action lawsuit settlement from e-cigarette company Juul. Buy yourself something nice on the house. The house being a massive corporation. On today's show, the FBI investigates leaked documents detailing Israel's plan to retaliate against Iran. Plus, Rudy Giuliani is losing his home and a car and some World Series memorabilia. But first, roughly 20 million people have already voted in the upcoming election, either by mail or in person. A handful of states have even set early voting records. Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump are running around the country, trying to sway as many voters as they can ahead of what's shaping up to be a historically close election. On Wednesday, Vice President Kamala Harris sat down with NBC for an interview with anchor Haley Jackson. She pressed Harris on whether her campaign was prepared for the possibility that former President Donald Trump claims victory before all the votes are counted. We will deal with election night and the days after as they come, and we have the resources and the expertise and the, and, and the focus on that as well. So you have teams ready to go? Is that what you're saying? Are you thinking about that as a possibility? Of course. This is a person, Donald Trump, who tried to undo the, a free and fair election, who still denies the will of the people. Harris followed that interview up with another interview with Telemundo's Julio Vaccario, aimed at undecided Latino voters, especially men. A lot of my agenda is Parte about de mi agenda tiene que ver con crear oportunidades para que la gente so, sea exitosa. Por ejemplo, parte de la agenda que he presentado está enfocada en el impacto en los hombres latinos. Necesitamos construir una economía fuerte que apoya a la gente trabajadora. While Harris was doing that, former President Barack Obama appeared with vice presidential nominee Tim Walls in Wisconsin. Obama then headed east for a rally in Detroit, where he was introduced by rapper Eminem. I also think that people shouldn't be afraid to express their opinions. And I don't think anyone wants an America where people are worried about retribution or what people will do if you make your opinion known. Meanwhile, Trump continues to fuel reports that he's exhausted by canceling yet another event. This time, a virtual town hall with his new BFF, former independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and former Hawaii Democratic Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Trump did start the morning at a roundtable with Latino leaders in Doral, Florida. Did he talk about issues specific to Latino voters? Not really. But he again floated his unsubstantiated claims of a, quote, enemy from within the federal government. This time, it was in reference to leaked U.S. intelligence documents about Israel's plans to attack Iran. Who did that? Can you imagine somebody doing that? That's that's the enemy. I guess that maybe is the enemy from within, as I talk about. We have an enemy from within. They hate to talk about it. But could you imagine? Could you imagine? Sure. Trump finished Tuesday with a rally in Greensboro, North Carolina. He once again repeated widely debunked bonkers claims about the federal government's response and defended his right to make those claims. And a lot lately, you probably see I followed that horrible storm, and then I came back, and we spent a lot of time here yesterday, met some incredible people. What they've done is unbelievable. They haven't had much help from our government in Washington, I can tell you that. This whole debunked FEMA conspiracy that Trump won't let go of plays into something darker that's happening in some spaces online, as more Americans become detached from reality amid an ecosystem that thrives on misinformation. That's according to Charlie Wurzel. He's a staff writer at The Atlantic who writes about tech and media. We talked about how this misinformation ecosystem could come into play during the election. Charlie, welcome to Water Day. Thank you for having me. So in a piece you wrote this month, you say, it's getting harder to describe the extent to which a meaningful percentage of Americans have disassociated from reality. So naturally, I'm going to ask you to describe what you're talking about here. How meaningful are we talking about? And what's different from, say a year or two ago, or even four years ago, because, you know, we both reported on the pro-Trump QAnon conspiracy. So what's what's different now? The thing that has changed is this notion of people who are sharing things that are are, are truly fake, like fake AI generated images mm-hmm. of disasters uh, <laughs> that happened, but the images didn't right. happen. Right. And when they're getting called out for these things, instead of, you know, deleting the post or saying, oh, I'm I'm sorry, I got duped. Uh, Apologies. They're coming out defensively and saying, no, no, no. It represents something that feels true or that I know to believe 
is true that has happened. And therefore, no, I'm not going to take it down. In fact, I'm proudly going to share this because it's almost truer than true. Right, right. The idea that it feels true, which means that it is true. And the knock-on effects are obvious. You know, we've seen a FEMA hurricane recovery team had to be relocated over safety concerns about an armed militia. The town of Springfield, Ohio, was terrorized after Trump and his running mate, J.D. Vance, made false claims about Haitian migrants eating pets. Both of those stories were thoroughly and repeatedly debunked. But to your point, Vance even said, you know, we need to create stories to get media attention, because even if the stories are fake, then people start paying attention and then something will happen that will be good for us. So I think that that, that really speaks to your point. Yeah. And, and something I wanted to get at near the end of that piece that I think is, is just is very important is that the aggregate effect of this is that anyone whose job intersects or attends to reality is is a person who will eventually become under attack by this type of misinformation or or who will be harassed or bullied or whatever in the real world. We're going to see this probably with election workers, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to be the targets of a lot of misinformation and harassment and probably threats and, and terrible stuff uh, at the very local level because they're just the people who are standing in between, you know, reality and this conspiracy theory. And I think that's just over a period of time, everyone's going to spend some time in the meat grinder there. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like it's coming for everyone in a way that's really grim and uh, and troubling. So what's the goal then? Is it to persuade people to buy into it? And if so, why? I mean, I would say in some cases money because culture war is a perfect money generator because you can't win it and you can't lose it. But from a political perspective, does this kind of alternative world building, does it motivate voters? Does it pull in new people who are scared? Like, what does it do? Why are we here? So I, I think that there is definitely a, you know, a group who are financially motivated. There's a group who are politically motivated to rile people up, et cetera. But uh, something that I, I wrote in the piece, and it's not my idea, but it's it's borrowed from uh, Michael Caulfield, who's at studies um, disinformation, misinformation at the University of Washington, he has long had this theory that we often think of misinformation as persuasion, right? Here's a person who goes about their time thinking normal thoughts, and then, you know, you throw a conspiracy theory at them and boom, they have, you know, a new worldview. He believes that it's really actually about inoculating people from having, you know, to see the truth, right? It's to keep people in a bubble. It's to reinforce a belief system. So rather than people having to at least even mentally kind of go through the exercise of why are storms getting worse? Why are we having these, you know, thousand year or hundred year rain events or whatever uh, every, you know, three weeks in the fall in Florida? Instead of having to go through that, you can default to this other theory, right? That the government's engineering these things because it's an election year and of course they are, right? Or, you know, the government is is trying to hurt communities in rural red areas so that they don't go out and vote and and you know they can protect their thing. It it this it's this idea that it's not really persuasion, it's it's the opposite. It's kind of an entrapment. And I think that that goes to my next question, which is what happens when the alternative reality isn't real? I think we've seen that already a couple of times. Um I, I was so struck by how like the right wing comment sphere became convinced about a month and a half ago that Kamala Harris was mere seconds away from dumping Governor Tim Walz from the ticket because of something like and you saw all of these accounts talking to each other about how this was actually going to happen. It was so terrible. And he was such a bad person. It was so obvious. And then, you know, in actual life, like he's the most popular person running on either ticket. None of this happened. And, you know, I've argued in the past that the work to get to January 6th, 2021 started in March 2020, when the entire right wing sphere started saying that Trump couldn't lose. And then he obviously right. did. So when, ob there is a point for everyone in which all the stuff you talk about or believe in has to run into reality. What happens then? Do we just get January 6th? I think there's a spectrum of it, right? There are people who I'm sure ultimately get tired of this and disillusioned with it. You know, maybe it's not a, a, a meaningful group, but it, I'm sure there are people out there for whom that happens. I'm sure there are people for whom it becomes 
a time when it feels so desperate that you do resort to violence or or real life protest, things like that. But I I go back to the point you made about not being able to lose or win a culture war. You just keep fighting it and you just keep finding ways, right? There's a sort of always a way to weasel yourself out of it, spin it back around into the, you know, the grievance complex. Because again, you, you it's a situation where it's never over, right? The next conspiracy is right around the corner and that's why it's profitable. Another tech writer named uh, Jason Kobler argued in a similar piece that we've entered into what he called the fuck it era of like AI slap and political messaging. And I, I've thought a lot about how I wrote in 2020 that Trump's campaign was way too online, like incredibly online. And now the entire right wing sphere is so online and talking to one another in these siloed spaces. And so the AI slap and the political messaging is going is bouncing back and forth among the same group of people. So looking forward to November, how do you see these trends playing out in what's expected to be a razor thin election? I don't know that you can be too online at this moment for for a campaign. Um, uh, what I th- what I think is going to happen is, I think regardless of the you know the what happens on election day, I think it's there's going to be a a very weird period of of chaos, right? Mm-hmm. I just think I think it's inevitable. I think probably the only way that there isn't a lot of post election day chaos is like a Donald Trump landslide, mm-hmm. right? I think that I think that you know if you see a, a semi decisive Harris win, I think that will unfortunately trigger a lot of these, you know, sort of world building misinformation systems to kind of go into overdrive. So that's that's sort of my my grim prediction. That is bleak. Uh, Is there anything more optimistic that you're thinking about, about this? Like, is is there a way out of this or through it or under it? Something. (laughs) I'm so, I'm terrible at parties. Um, So, (laughs) okay. I think that the two things that have me feeling a little bit optimistic are one, Donald Trump is not in power. Right. Um, so I think that, that that's like a very in terms of transfer of power, things like that. I think that that's like really it's quite a mm-hmm. meaningful point. And it's something that people should also keep in mind that it is not 2020. Um, and I also think that the, the next part of this is we tend to run these, you know, scenarios for the the next election through the exact lens of the old one. Mm-hmm. And I think as a public, we, we have seen some of these playbooks run before. They will be run differently, probably. But I also think like there is a group of people in place that are being vigilant about this. So I think that, that those two things are are different from 2020 in a meaningful way. And I, I am, you know, s- slightly optimistic that that it, at least this is going to be matched with, you know, a sort of a, a counteroffensive if if something you know, 2020 ish begins to happen. Charlie, thank you so much for joining me. It's always really good to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me. We'll get to some of the news in a moment. But if you like the show, make sure to subscribe, leave a five star review on Apple Podcasts and share with your friends. And now the news. Headline. We're deeply concerned and the president remains deeply concerned uh, about any leakage of classified information into the public domain. Uh, uh, that that is not supposed to happen. And it's unacceptable when it does. So he's deeply concerned about that. On Tuesday, the Federal Bureau of Investigations announced it is investigating a possible leak of classified documents that allegedly outline Israel's plans to attack Iran. The announcement comes days after the U.S. intelligence documents, some of which were labeled top secret, were posted on an Iranian-linked Telegram account. Here's White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby speaking with reporters during a briefing on Monday. You can rest assured that he will be actively monitoring the progress uh, of the investigative effort to figure out how this happened. The leak is considered one of the largest breaches of U.S. intelligence in years. The documents were allegedly from the National Security Agency and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Israeli officials say the leak has no impact on its plans to take further actions against Iran. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in Israel Tuesday 
where he met with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and according to the State Department, the conversation focused on the need for Israel to take additional steps to increase the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza. Blinken apparently took it a step further and said that if conditions don't improve, Israel risks losing U.S. military support. He encouraged Netanyahu to use the killing of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar as an opportunity to secure a hostage deal and end Israel's war in Gaza. Blinken and his team also questioned Netanyahu about the so-called General's Plan, in which members of the Israeli government have suggested taking full control of northern Gaza by starving and or shooting any civilians who refuse to leave. Blinken also met with other Israeli officials throughout the day, including Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, and postponed a scheduled visit to Jordan. He's set to travel to countries in the Middle East this week to continue ceasefire discussions for the war in Gaza and the conflict with Hezbollah in Lebanon. Former mayor of New York City, Trump loyalist and disbarred lawyer Rudy Giuliani was ordered by a federal judge on Tuesday to turn over his Upper East Side penthouse to two Georgia election workers who he defamed. Giuliani first circulated a video of Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman counting ballots on election night, making false claims that they were committing election fraud. The video was played during Moss's testimony before the United States House Select Committee on the January 6th attack. Ruby Freeman and Shea Freeman Moss and one other gentleman, quite obviously surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they're vials of heroin or cocaine. I mean, it's it's, it's obvious to anyone who's a criminal investigator or prosecutor, they are engaged in surreptitious illegal activity again that day. They weren't. Moss and Freeman's lawsuit claimed that Giuliani's comments caused them emotional and reputational harm and put them in physical danger. Giuliani was found liable for defamation in August and ordered to pay $148 million to Moss and Freeman. But he doesn't have $148 million, and his bankruptcy filing got tossed because he wouldn't cooperate with the courts. So now he gets to hand over his apartment, several luxury watches, a signed Joe DiMaggio jersey, and a Mercedes previously owned by Lauren Bacall. Donald Trump is set to go on the Joe Rogan experience this week. Politico was the first to report that the former president will record a conversation with Rogan on Friday. The upcoming interview is seemingly part of the Trump campaign's push to reach young male voters, a demographic that Trump is popular with but doesn't always actually show up to the polls. Rogan's podcast boasts 14 million followers on Spotify, most of whom are men ages 18 to 34, and it's generally known to be friendly to conservative voices. But he's never had Trump on the show. In fact, Rogan has said in the past that Trump and his team have approached him multiple times to have the former president on the show, but the podcaster has always turned them down. Here he is in the Lex Friedman podcast in 2022. By the way, I'm not a Trump supporter in any way, shape, or form. I've had the opportunity to have him on my show more than once. I've said no every time. I don't want to help him. I'm not interested in helping him. But maybe now he is. Vice President Kamala Harris's campaign is also reportedly in talks with Rogan for a potential interview though that hasn't been confirmed. And that's the news. One more thing. Over the last few weeks, a lot of people have been noticing the same basic phenomenon. Man, Donald Trump spends a lot of time screaming about how he wants to punish his enemies. In fact, that's kind of his whole deal now. Sure, his campaign will tell us that he's very concerned about access to IVF. He isn't. Or that he cares deeply about nutrition. Come on. But what he wants to talk about is how much he wants to put the people who don't like him in prison, or send the military after them, or some horrifying combination of the two. A new report from NPR found that Trump has threatened to prosecute or punish anyone he doesn't like more than 100 times. And we've got the tape to prove it. Let's start with his attacks on the media. And that's a big statement because he does it a lot. But let's talk specifically about CBS and the show 60 Minutes. Think of it. 60 Minutes CBS, and they ought to lose their license, and they ought to take it off the air. And then he doubled down. I've spoken out about the unethical editing of the Kamala Harris interview by 60 Minutes. Terrible. Uh, But you go a step further, and you say CBS should lose its license. And he kept going. What we're doing is we're going to subpoena their records because we want to see how much else did she do. But we all know that 60 Minutes is hardly alone. The threats are to all of the press. Abuse them also. So, you know, I do that. Did you say, did you target them and say, I'm going to go attack media and I'm going to go after them? Is that part of strategy that you had? Or no, that was just, no. if you come after me, I'm going to come after you. I think it's a natural instinct with me, you know, like it would be for you and other people that know how to win a little bit. And then there were the threats to send reporters to jail. And if the reporter doesn't want to tell you, it's bye bye. The reporter goes to jail. But the threats aren't limited to the media. There are, of course, his threats to President Joe Biden, 
I will appoint a real special prosecutor to go after the most corrupt president in the history of the United States of America, Joe Biden, and the entire Biden crime family. And a reminder to all of us how he will, dic- I mean, preside over the country if he gets back into office. As president, you have tremendous, you, it's called extreme power. You have extreme power. And of course, this classic. I add, I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. Not gonna let me... No, thank you. Now, we could be here for another 20 minutes listening to more times Trump threaten someone because of reasons that only make sense to him. Or I could simply remind you that when you vote, you can help us avoid all of this and avoid putting that guy back into the White House. That's all for today. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, contemplate what you would do with Rudy Giuliani's Upper East Side apartment after you smudge it to rid it of the ancient spirits, of course, and tell your friends to listen. And if you're into reading and not just contemplating the non-reality of internet reality and whether it reflects the triumph of postmodernism, like me, What A Day is also a nightly newsletter. Check it out and subscribe at crooked.com slash subscribe. I'm Jane Coaston, and good for you, Shay and Ruby. Good for you.